Kicking off our list here at number 10, we have Mount Weather. Not to be confused with Mount Chiliad, although that one's quite mysterious as well. We'll save that for another video. Mount Weather in Virginia is an emergency operations center. It's the go-to spot in case of any national emergency. These are for the higher, higher ups, you know what I mean? Like in the movie 2012, they would have went here. The facility is around 560 acres, and it's also used as the command center for the federal emergency alert system. So if there were ever a day where the president needed to announce anything massive, this is where he'd go to do so. It's about an hour away from Washington DC, and after the 2001 September attacks, the news reported that these high-level leaders of Congress were taken just 75 miles west of Washington. There was a literal traffic jam of government vehicles going that direction. Also from above, Mount Weather looks like it's hiding military style support housing. These notches in the side of the hill are peculiar, to say the least. And that's just the beginning of our list here. Number nine, Randolph Mackin Women's College. Yeah, when you think of a doomsday bunker or anything hidden below the surface of the earth, you're thinking airports, right? Something massive, vaults in the middle of the Arctic maybe, some secret Bermuda Triangle, alien base, whatever. Well, look no further than Lynchburg, Virginia at Randolph College. So around World War II, just like most of these places that I'll mention on this list, a bunker was made to protect people, government officials, and sometimes art. The National Gallery of Art hid paintings in North Carolina, so another privately funded facility at Randolph College was also at the ready. It was this three bedroom hideout for the gallery's curator. You can't forget about art on this list, it's also important. Number eight, the Shanghai Complex. Most of the details of this one are still unknown, as are the other ones on this list as well. How fun is that? A mysterious Shanghai Complex, let's talk about it. It's this massive underground bunker, as you probably could have guessed, and it's supposedly able to fit 200,000 civilians comfortably. It's over 100 million square feet, and it was built in case, well, a nuclear attack were to happen. This was revealed through a newspaper article back in 2006. Imagine reading about this one morning, I'd be like, hi, what? What? The Shanghai Morning Post touched on the new complex saying that it's got massive protective doors, electricity, good lighting, good ventilation, all that good stuff, and it can fully support life for two full weeks. And yes, it's very secure. Number seven, Pine Gap. Going to the land down under for this one, here we go. Pine Gap is a secret military compound built around the Cold War, and it's been described as Australia's Area 51. Doesn't mean that there's aliens there, but you never know. All we know of this secret base on this mysterious island was revealed back in 2013 thanks to our man Edward Snowden. Yeah, he revealed quite a bit, actually. Turns out this island is not a fun resort. In fact, it's a satellite surveillance base that runs espionage operations. And it's got a lot of underground hidden bunkers. You can't even get close to this thing. The NSA is currently using this facility for global interception, and they also collect internet and telephone communication records. So your voicemail to chat is probably lying in a USB somewhere. Back in the 70s, around 400 American families moved to the nearby Alice Springs. Why? Eh, just for fun, it seems. Just for the waves just for surfing the web and the waves. Number six, the Greenbrier. Located in Sulphur Springs in West Virginia, this US hideout was crucial during, you guessed it, the Cold War. Just 250 miles west of the capital city, the Greenbrier Resort got a fun little expansion as it was being built back in 1958. This expansion to the resort was not another spa. There was no water parks, no splash pool, anything like that. Rather, it was a secret bunker for United States Congress. This bunker was more of an underground city, if anything. When I say bunker, it's like a little where you have to hide in. No, this had a massive cafeteria. This had a dentist's office in case you get a cavity while you're hanging out down there. The crazy thing was, obviously this information was kept under wraps as best as they could, but according to Jared M. Graff, author of Raven Rock, conferences were being held in these public spaces at this resort, but the people walking through there never realized what these actually were. They never realized the bunker's true intentions. It was a doomsday chamber all around them this whole time, and they're having resort meetings. One thing employees did notice was how many urinals were in the building, which is, to be fair, that's kind of funny. That's the first thing I would notice. Number five, Denver International Airport. Since its opening in 1995, Denver International Airport, DIA, has been the subject of many myths. I've heard about this before, this is hilarious. I think it's in Tony Hawk, probably, I don't know. Some are so bizarre I had to include it on our list today. Yeah, lizard people, apparently they like to build airports. The more you know. So far it's believed that the Freemasons built the airport, or the Illuminati, or the New World Order. 
The airport itself is massive. It covers around 52 square miles. There's literal gargoyles that are just hanging out near baggage claim. The art displayed there is a little odd, so I get it. It does seem creepy. Maybe you want to know more about it. But the airport has started to lean into this conspiracy. They're actually laughing at this stuff by now. They have a conspiracy month that began back in 2016. How fun. Imagine going to the airport and they're like, oh, it's conspiracy month. I'm like, what? what? I just want to fly Delta. What's going on? They even show a screening of Close Encounters of the Third Kind. So yeah, like I said, they're really leaning into this. I would have leaned into something too if I was hiding a secret bunker and if I was guilty. Just saying. Number four, Project Iceworm. Oh, here's a fun one. As a Canadian, this project sounds like the worst one on this list. So impossibly cold. It's so cold out today. I'm freezing doing this list. Back in 1960s, under the Greenland ice sheet, the US Army started to build a mobile nuclear missile launch site. The code name was Project Iceworm, which is pretty fitting under the ground and ice. You got it, I didn't have to explain it. They were close enough that they could hit targets within the Soviet Union, right? That was the entire point here. This project was called Project Iceworm, but there was another project called Camp Sentry that had to be completed first. You can't just show up with a bunch of shovels and be like, all right, let's attack them. No, you have to make a base first. You gotta make sure it's livable. Camp Sentry was a network of underground tunnels and places for workers to stay. There was a kitchen, a hall, supply rooms, communication center, all that good stuff. There was also a nuclear power plant, so things were getting pretty official. Things were well on their way, to say the least. This was kept from the Danish government for seven years, but in 1966, the project was cancelled because of shifting ice. Or was it? Number three, the floating White House. This one's not an underground bunker per se, but it was once a doomsday ship. That counts. Also, it's under the water, so it can technically blow uh, Earth level. I don't know. This was back in 1962, before Air Force One. There was a presidential yacht or two. These yachts sound glamorous, but really it's just a floating doomsday bunker. Lincoln had a steamboat during the Civil War that he used, and it was called the River Queen. The USS Mayflower was used by Roosevelt. Then later on, two Navy command ships were ready in the 60s. There was a light cruiser and a light aircraft carrier, one of which was always in the water near the president, just floating by, just lurking about. This is when the Soviet Union had a weak Navy, so the odds of them finding the president's ship in the Atlantic, well, those odds were slim. That is until, of course, satellite technology became a thing Thing, and then we started looking down from above and then after that the floating presidential bunker wasn't hidden obviously it's probably the worst place to put a president at this point actually just in the middle of the water they're like eh, let's play battleship I guess number two Metro 2 how fitting two and two let's do it an underground metro or an underground city. Over in Moscow, there have been many tales of this underground city hiding deep beneath Russia's capital. Once World War II ended, these underground shelters were underway. And originally they were designed to protect civilians, but they had to be done in secret. And also you needed roads to connect these bunkers. So we might as well create a second metro. We'll call it that, a second metro. It was labeled as Metro 2. The rumors of course are that these hidden tunnels and bunkers are still being used by the KGB. Back in 1994, this exploration group called the Diggers, supposedly found the entrance to this underground KGB tunnel city. Living in Toronto, we have one underground subway station that's like kind of abandoned. Pretty sure the KGB isn't hiding there. I haven't checked though in a while, but maybe I'll take a look. I'll get my boys the Diggers and we'll go and take a look. And finally, number one, the Svalbard Vault. Over the pandemic, I spent a lot of time playing video games and stuff like that, obviously, keep my mind busy. And most of my favorite games, I realized, have a similar like doomsday, post-apocalyptic feel, like Fallout 4, I was playing it and I'm like, this isn't really, this feels stressful. It's stressful, but quite engaging. And in real life, we have a global seed vault, and it's deep, deep in the Arctic Circle, on the island Spitsbergen. It's this massive bunker that has since been deemed the Doomsday Vault. How fun. This is where humans will store food crops, and it contains 100 million seeds. So if the earth all of a sudden gets wiped out, or even if all the ice melts, this vault will be good to go. We won't survive, but we have seeds. All that water just flooded the rest of humanity will now regrow the earth, ideally, which sounds so horrible, but weirdly cute. I'm kind of concerned. Is there something we don't know about this vault? Is that seed guy from Breath of the Wild hanging out in there with his loud maracas? Or Santa? I mean, Santa's only 800 miles away from this area, so he could be hiding here. You never know. Starting off this countdown, we have the bluffs. Scarborough, Ontario is known for their bluffs. We call them the Scarborough Bluffs. It's a very popular place to go to, and the view is amazing. Tons of people like climbing to the top of the bluffs and then like looking down at the lake below. But over the time, the bluffs have been subjected to erosion and have had landslides. And some of the ground on top of the bluffs has been known to give away under people's feet. They get too close to the edge. As a result, they fenced off the bluffs to avoid this from happening. They even have a security guard monitoring the area to prevent people from going to these bluffs. Sadly, people still don't listen, and a number of people have snuck their way 
way to the top of the bluffs. A number of people have fallen to their death. In 2018, there were 18 incidents that involved people falling down from the bluffs. People don't understand just how dangerous this area is. They look at it as a good photo opportunity. In our ninth spot today, we have Disneyland. Now you might be like, huh? Lindsay, Disney is not a prohibited location to visit. Well, yes, you're allowed to go there during the day when it's open, but it's illegal to try to enter the park and trespass when it's closed during the night. That's what teen Thomas Guy Cleveland tried to do in 1956. Now the park wasn't completely closed. It was hosting their annual grad night. Thomas thought it would be a good idea to try to sneak into the park. So he climbed over the park's 16 foot high fence. Then he climbed onto the monorail track. His plan was to then run along the monorail track until he was inside the park and then jump or climb down. However, this didn't go according to plan. While trying to sneak into the park, the monorail came along the track and struck him. It ended up dragging his body 30 to 40 feet down the track. He sadly lost his life. In our eighth spot today, we have SeaWorld. What's with people trying to sneak into amusement parks at night? This is another example of it gone terribly, terribly wrong. On July 6th of 1999, a man named Daniel Dukes snuck into SeaWorld. It said that Daniel was kind of a hippie and he loved animals. All he wanted to do was to be able to swim with the whales. So he stayed into the park until it closed and then managed to elude security in order to make his way to Tillicum's tank. That's where he hopped in naked and swam around. Sadly, Tillicum attacked and killed him. He was found the next day dead, floating on the back of Tillicum. His body was so badly disfigured from the whale that they had to do a closed casket funeral. In fact, chunks of his skin and body were found floating around the tank. In our seventh spot today, we have the Hawaii Blowhole. The Halom Blowhole in Hawaii is quite an amazing sight to see, but it is very, very dangerous. Hence why it's fenced off and surrounded by signs saying no trespassing. Well, in June of 2002, Daniel Dick and his family went on vacation in Hawaii. Where they were staying was connected to a beach and the beach was right by this blowhole. One morning, Daniel went out to the beach alone and started chatting up some girls. From there, he convinced them to come with him to this blowhole. While there, Daniel hopped over the fence and went directly to it. He hovered over the blowhole until it shot up water. Daniel ended up shooting up into the sky and then on his way down, he fell into the blowhole. He was then trapped in there and it was high tide, so it was impossible to swim out or to climb out of it the way that he came in. He was stuck in there for nearly 20 hours before it was safe to save him. But by that time, he had already died. In our sixth spot today, we have the Stairway to Heaven. Located in Hawaii, the Stairway to Heaven is considered one of Hawaii's most dangerous trails. It's very steep and a number of people have died or have gotten badly injured from climbing it. As a result, it was closed in 1987, but that didn't stop Dalen Pua. On February 27th of 2015, Dalen trespassed into the area and decided to climb this path. He had done so without telling his family where he was going. He knew that they would stop him because his grandmother told him just how dangerous it was. Sadly, he never returned home. His body was never found. The last time Dalen's family ever heard from him was around 11 a.m. that day when he texted his family a photo of him at the trail. Theory goes that he ended up falling to his death. We're now at our fifth and halfway mark with Pelican Valley. In July of 1984, a woman named Brigitte Friedenhagen and her three pals were exploring this area. Brigitte had plans to stay the night in Pelican Valley, which is near Yellowstone National Park. It is very dangerous though. In fact, park rangers say you should only go there if you're in a group of four to seven during the day and you have to stick to the path. Brigitte, however, decided to go alone and camp the night. That night, she was attacked and killed by a bear. It dragged her out of her tent by her skull and sadly ate her. The park rangers literally warned her about staying there alone, but she assured them that she was an experienced camper and that she could handle it. Sadly, the park rangers were right. In our fourth spot, we have Snake Island. Now, I didn't mention Snake Island in my last video and I got so many comments being like, what about Snake Island? But then when I do mention Snake Island, you guys are like, ugh, not Snake Island again. So I can't win. But I will say it does deserve a spot on today's list, so I'm putting it there. So as most of you know, Snake Island is a very dangerous island located in Brazil. And that's because this island is home to around 4,000 snakes. 
most of them being golden lance head vipers, aka one of the deadliest serpents in the world. It's said that this type of viper can grow up to 18 inches long, and it's so poisonous that one bite can kill you within an hour. A number of people who have gone to this island have wound up dead. First off, we have the family that was actually running a lighthouse on the island from 1909 to the 1920s. That was until the entire family was found dead in the lighthouse from snake attacks. Another time, a fisherman came to the island searching for bananas and he never made it home. He was found days later in his boat in a pool of his own blood. As a result, the Brazilian government has banned anyone from ever going there. And if you do, they say that you won't make it back alive and you'll die within an hour. In our third spot today, we have Yellowstone Hot Springs. Yellowstone has a number of natural springs that are absolutely beautiful. Some you're even allowed to swim in. Others will literally cook you alive. In fact, at least 22 people have died from hot spring related injuries. As a result, there are clear signs on areas you can and cannot visit. All visitors must remain on the boardwalk. Straying off this path can be deadly, and that's what happened to Colin Nathaniel Scott in June of 2016. He was with his sister out looking for a place to hot pot, aka to soak in some warm water, and while out looking for this place, he ended up slipping and falling into a boiling hot spring. Emergency services were unable to retrieve his body right away. By the time that they got to him, his body had dissolved from the boiling temperatures. All that was left of him was his wallet and melted flip-flops. In our second spot today, we have North Sentinel Island. Now, this is another island that we have talked about a lot on this channel. Again, it definitely deserves a spot on today's list. Now, the island is home to a tribe that is so isolated from the rest of the world, and they do not like outsiders, which makes sense, okay? They just want to protect themselves and their home. But a man named John Allen Cho thought that it was his job to help him that this is what God wanted him to do. And if he taught them Christianity, then he could change their lives. So on November of 2018, he headed out to this island. Although a number of people refused to take him there and literally told him that it was a death wish. In the end, he made multiple attempts to befriend the Sentinelese, but they were not having it. They would fire arrows at him to try and get him to leave, but he was persistent. November 16th was the last time anyone would ever see Alan again. Alan was dropped off on the island and when the boater went back to get him, he saw tribe members dragging his dead body by a rope. And in our number one spot today, we have the Nika Caves, Mexico. Now this is a beautiful cave filled with giant crystals or gypsum pillars. The cave was discovered in 1910 when miners were drilling in the area, but soon the area was deemed unsafe and that's because of the climate. The air temperature is around 113 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 47 degrees Celsius. And the humidity is killer, literally. The levels were close to 100%, meaning if anyone was in there for more than 10 minutes without special breathing apparatuses, then their lungs will fill with water and they will drown. So the caves were closed off. That was until two miners drilled into it while searching a separate area nearby. When they got inside, they saw all these giant crystals. They're like, uh, you're coming home with me. Little did they know the hazard of being there. So one of the miners started sawing off one of the giant crystals. However, it ended up falling and pinning him under it. Now, this didn't actually kill him. What killed him was being in this hot environment for too long. It said that he either drowned to death or that he was cooked alive. Kicking off the list at number 10, Snake Island. Well, this island already sounds awful. What's going on here? Snake Island is located 95 miles off the coast of Sao Paulo, Brazil. Is that just a name of an island or do a bunch of snakes live here? Well, sorry to tell you. Both. What happened originally was thousands of years ago, the part of the land that once connected the island to mainland disappeared. The ocean rose up before any of these snakes had time to pack their snake bags and they were stuck on this island forever. These snakes were stuck on the island decade after decade, so now these stuck snakes are just gonna you know, mate and have more snakes. Now the island's full of snakes. The number of snakes is going up. Higher and higher, it's never stopping. One of the deadliest snakes in the world, the Golden Lancehead Viper. Yeah, there's over 4,000 of them on this island. It's horrible. Back from 1902 to the early 1920s, a few brave souls lived there and operated the lighthouse. But according to some local myths, the last lighthouse keeper was swarmed by snakes after he left a window open. Worst thing I've ever heard, let's move on. Number nine, Surtsey Island. While some islands ban humans, others ban humans and seeds. Yeah, no seeds allowed on Surtsey Island. 
Leave the work snackies behind, my friend. Surtsey Island is an important one on our list here today, as this island was born in 1963. We got a brand new baby island. This new island emerged from the sea 20 miles off the coast of Iceland, and it took around four years for Mother Nature to complete this little passion project. An undersea volcano formed this island over the course of four years just slowly just making a new island. That's a long, hot process, so now what? What do you do with a brand new island? Sandals Resort? Disney Parks? No and nope. Nobody is allowed on this island. The whole idea of Surtsey Island, which I love, is that scientists are trying to study how ecosystems can form themselves without the involvement of us, of us humans. Scientists around the world have all gathered around to do nothing about this island. They're just gonna watch. Only a select few can enter this island, and right before they clock in, they're checked head to toe to make sure they don't have any seeds. Zero seeds. Why? Oh, because scientists found a tomato growing and they were scratching their heads. Where did this come from? How, out of nowhere, how could it be? They were stumped until they found out somebody went number two in that same spot long before. Yeah, welcome to Surtsey Island. Hold it. Better not take a shit here or you're fired, buddy. Number eight. North Sentinel Island. Heading over to India, this island is the home of the Sentinelese tribe. One of the most forbidden islands on the world. We're talking about it, let's do it. Located in the Bay of Bengal, North Sentinel Island is about 1,200 kilometers away from India. And while most islands are shrinking, this one is actually growing. It grew back in 2004 phenomenally. Back in 2004, the island lifted up a couple of meters during an earthquake. So the west and south sides gained an extra kilometer. The inhabitants on North Sentinel Island are among the few uncontacted tribes left in the world. You've probably heard about them or seen the thumbnail at some point. They have apparently been around for thousands of years, but there's no sign of agriculture or even fire. Yet still, this tribe has somehow continued to thrive. If we try and get close, they will attack us. After the 2004 tsunami, the Indian Coast Guard flew over to check on the island, make sure everyone's okay. But once they flew too close, the tribe attacked with arrows. So they could not land, obviously, but what if you arrived by boat? What would happen? Well also bad. Back in 2006, two fishermen lost their lives because they got too close to the island without knowing who was on it. The Sentinelese have lived here for around 60,000 years, and I don't think they're going anywhere anytime soon. Number seven, Niwa Island. Located in Hawaii, Niwa Island is quite small, and its population as well is pretty minimal, but why? Where is everyone? This is a beautiful island. Why wouldn't you want to live here? Why do only 170 people live on arguably one of the most beautiful islands in the world? Niwa Island has also been referred to as the Forbidden Island, hence why we're including it on our list here today. It was bought back in 1864 by Elizabeth Sinclair and it's been privately owned since then. So no one knows what's going on, hence the small population. The thing is though, in 1952, the polio epidemic hit the islands and a ban was then put in place permanently. You couldn't leave or enter the island. That's it. Locked down to the extreme, like an island locked down, that'd be so scary. Nobody got sick, but now if you want to enter the island, you need to gain special access, which is a lot harder than it may seem. Absolutely no tourists or outsiders allowed, period. It was sold by Hawaii's king Kamakamaha back in 1863 to the Robinson family, but as of 1915, no outsiders, again, are still allowed in. Some island cult behavior is going on here, I don't know. Whoever lives here does so without plumbing, telephone lines, or Netflix. Impressive. Even today, the island is, of course, off bounds. The Coast Guard is always patrolling the island, too, as well. What do you think lies on Niwa Island? Top secret government stuff? Probably. Number six, Heard Island. Have you heard about this island? Heard Island? No? Well, listen up. Right in the middle of Antarctica and Australia, there is this island, Heard Island. The Australian government has made it illegal for anybody to visit it, so if you have some free time and a kayak and some suntan lotion, don't even think about it. Go the other way. You won't make it. So why is this island forbidden? Is this one full of deadly snakes? Maybe, honestly. The myth here surrounding Heard Island is that there's animals we don't even know exist living here. We got some secret hybrid animals. This sounds a lot like Jurassic Park so far. The island itself is quite unique geographically. See, Heard Island is home to two volcanoes as well as the tallest mountain in Australia. So there's plenty of space for hybrid animals to hide and be scary. I love the idea of animals getting their own island, honestly. We have, we have enough, I'd say. Time to give one or two back. Except for Snake Island, that one, we don't want that one. You can keep that one for sure. Number five, North Brother Island. Located right between Rikers Island and the Bronx, quietly tucked away on the East River, North Brother Island was once home to a hospital back in the 19th century. You may be thinking a hospital on an island, how inconvenient is this? What's going on? Riverside Hospital was available for patients suffering from yellow fever, smallpox, or tuberculosis. So it was a quarantine zone, essentially. The hospital has since been abandoned. It's now sitting there literally falling to pieces. And the island has been quite active, oddly. A body was found near the island recently. A steamship called the General Slocum crashed on the island. There's also a haunted lighthouse on this island. And they even have what's referred to as Coffin Corner 
on this island. Yeah, coffin corner. I'm all set. I'd rather explore the Bronx than explore this island, honestly. Number four, Robin's Island. Okay, we have a forbidden island and it's not cursed. We have a nice one, dare I say, here we go. The privately owned Robinson Island is massive and beautiful. It's not made of lava or snakes, it's just sand and trees, just a good time. And best of all, no humans at all. The 435 acre island sits off the coast of New Suffolk, New York. Many names have come and go when it comes to island ownership here, but as of right now, it's forbidden and it's a nature preserve. I'm okay with that, we can stay away from that one. The owner now is a man named Louis Bacon. He has poured time and money into building the sanctuary and he fears that if anybody else gets involved, the whole thing will just fail. Honestly, considering our number one spot, he's got a point. Aside from that side quest that Mr. Bacon's pulling off, Robbins Island is also home to the largest population of turtles in the state. So don't worry, he's not completely alone. He's got a bunch of turtles. Number three, Diego Garcia Island. An island with an airport. Okay, there's gotta be something good here, right? Located in the Indian Ocean, Diego Garcia is perhaps one of the most bizarre on this list. Definitely interesting. The island was once a part of the United Kingdom, but in order to settle up a debt in the millions, the UK had to hand it over to the United States. Gee, I wonder what they did with it. Is it a turtle sanctuary? Is it a forbidden seed island part two, perhaps? What's the game plan here? What are we doing? Well, today Diego Garcia is a top secret military base, hence the airport. Although it's forbidden to enter, there's over 600 buildings resting on this island, as well as thousands of military personnel, but again, nobody knows what the island is really hiding or what it's being used for. Maybe this is where they're keeping the winter soldier. Could be. He could punch through anyone. You can punch 6,000 people easily. Number two, Paviglia Island. The small island of Paviglia has taken many, many lives. When the bubonic plague arrived in 1348, the island then became a quarantine colony, just like our one earlier. So if you had symptoms, you were sent to this island to, yeah. It was a sad reality, not a lot of solutions back then. Again, in 1630, the Black Death crept in and once again, the center of this island became a mass graveyard. All bad so far. The soil, they say, is 50% human remains at this point. So if you're looking to plant some haunted sunflowers, there you go. There's your soil, weirdo. Today the island is abandoned, rightfully so. It's closed off to both tourists and locals. Hey, now that things are opening up again, what do you say we head to Pavigli Island? Check out some bubonic plague history. No, we're good? All right, cool. We'll go to Niagara Falls. If it's dark history doesn't scare you away, the ghost stories surrounding the island might. In the early 20th century, mentally ill patients were sent to this island, but the doctor that was responsible for curing them for all these treatments, he would actually try these bizarre, insane methods. Cruel methods, really. And the doctor himself ended up going mad, and he ended up jumping to his death from the bell tower. The bell tower no longer stands, but the soil is still 50% remains, so either way, ghosts or history, that's a no from me. I would rather go to... Number one, Garbage Island. We must finish with this one, the largest island of them all. The Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Mmm, smells good. It smells like the ocean and all the garbage we've thrown into it. It's located in the North Pacific subtropical gyre. There's basically four of these large systems just swirling ocean currents, and some of them are chock full of garbage. Pretty disturbing, right? I've heard of the Garbage Patch before, but I had no idea how large it really was. This trash island is three times the size of France, and if that's not big enough for you, it's twice the size of Texas. Someone's like, oh, now I get it. This island is man-made, obviously, and it continues to grow. But it's not all grim, however, for our number one spot. There is a team working on reducing that size. The environmental nonprofit Ocean Cleanup has removed around 65,000 pounds of trash. So maybe next time you see this, there'll be only nine islands. We're hoping. Mm -hmm.